Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the workers training tonight. Thank you because we know that you are mightily present here. We're asking, Lord, that you open our eyes of understanding, that we'll see and behold, as well as experience, mighty power of your saving truth in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Psalm 51, and I'm reading from verses 12 and 13. Psalm 51, verses 12 and 13. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Here we find David, the psalmist, a king, a real child of God, a man that was called that he will do the will of God, the fullness, the entirety, the totality of the will of God. We know what had happened to him. But now, after what happened, happened, he wanted that salvation, the joy, the victory, and the assurance that that salvation has come back unto him. And so he prayed, and in his prayer, he said, Restore unto me, number one, your salvation, number two, the joy of salvation, then the assurance of salvation, the victory that comes through salvation, and the understanding of the relationship, reconciliation we have with God as the salvation comes in. And he wants that feeling again, that fellowship again, that friendliness again, and that interaction again, that intimacy again between him and the Almighty God. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. It says, I know when that salvation is restored and the joy is restored, I will be upheld. I will stand with thy free spirit. Only then will I have the authority. Only then will I have the assignment. Only then will I have the assurance I can talk to other sinners too. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. It says there is sin, he will declare the word of salvation. The truth of salvation to sinners is for their conversion. But he must have that conversion first. That salvation first. That victory he must have first. We're coming to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 76. Luke chapter 1, verse 76. It says, and thou child, this is um, Zechariah talking about the son John, and thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. That's what a prophet does. That's what a preacher does. That's what a pastor does to prepare the way of the Lord so that the people will see it clearly how to come to the Lord. Verse 77, to give the knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of sins. A preacher comes, a pastor comes, a soul winner comes, a believer comes to another one. And he stands before the people representing God and is calling them to salvation and is giving the knowledge of salvation unto the people. And then through that knowledge of salvation, 
they will have the removal and the cleansing and the forgiveness and the remission and the washing away of their sin. And then he tells us how that salvation comes, how that remission, removal of sin comes in verse 78, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Verse 79, to give the light unto them that sit in darkness and also in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Salvation brings peace, brings pardon, brings forgiveness, brings righteousness, brings redemption. And it says when that knowledge of salvation comes, it will guide our feet in the way of peace. The salvation of the Lord grants us forgiveness, freedom, peace, joy, the fruit of the Spirit. But the preacher, the soul winner, the minister must declare that word of salvation for people to have a clear understanding of what it means to be saved and then they come to know the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, reading from verse 47. Acts chapter 13 from verse 47. For so as the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for the salvation of the ends of the earth. That shows us very clearly our calling is to call people to the way of salvation and to bring light to the people, understanding to the people, so that with the understanding of the way of salvation, the word of truth, the word of salvation, they will know what it means to have the salvation of the Lord and what the effect and the impact is of that salvation of the Lord. Verse 48, and when the Gentiles had this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were dead to eternal life believed. You have to do something with the word before the salvation will come. The word of salvation comes the truth of salvation comes, the light of salvation comes, the knowledge of salvation comes. And you take that, you accept that, you believe that, you rely on that, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that is the only way to get the salvation of the Lord. And then you are given eternal life as you believe. Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was published. That's the word of salvation. The word of the Lord was published. That's the word of his grace. That's the word of the gospel, the good news that brings people out of sin into salvation, out of darkness into light. The word of the Lord was published throughout the all the region, throughout that region. Tonight, we're looking at the Word of God on the subject, proclaiming the gospel of salvation to every creature. Proclaiming the Word, the grace, the good news, the gospel of salvation to every creature. Why tell everyone? Because they want everyone saved. Why preach the gospel of salvation to every creature? Because he wants everyone to know, everyone to have, everyone to believe that word of salvation so that as they know, as they understand, they will take action and they will come into that gospel. And as they believe the truth of salvation, the reality of salvation, will come unto them. Mark chapter 16. Reading from verse 15. Mark 
16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Reach everyone. Touch everyone. Enlighten everyone. Preach to everyone. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That it says, you must do something about it. Verse 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Is the word of salvation. Gospel of salvation. The truth of salvation. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Tonight, as we bring the word on proclaiming the gospel of salvation to every creature, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, preaching repentance toward God before salvation. The salvation doesn't just come to everybody. There must be repentance, preaching repentance toward God before salvation. Point number two, after that salvation, with the experience of that salvation, with the knowledge of that salvation, with the grace in that salvation that comes to man, point number two, possessing the righteousness of God with salvation. Salvation is not just there in isolation dangling. It comes with righteousness. And as we believe the Lord, turn away from our sin and turn to the Lord, and we really have a genuine experience of salvation, righteousness will be visible. Possessing the righteousness of God with salvation. And as we move on, as we live on, point number three now, promoting the reign of God. God reigns. God has dominion. God controls. God leads. God conquers all that had been in man, that made man to go away from him. But now God reigns in the heart in the mind, in the life of the one that has salvation. Point number three, promoting the reign of God through salvation. He reigns in our hearts, in our lives, in our character, in our behavior. God reigns, and that reign of God comes through the salvation he has given to us, promoting the reign of God through salvation. Point number one, preaching repentance toward God before salvation. Before somebody can truly be saved, he must repent of sin. But you must hear that from the preacher. The preacher must tell him or her, that sin destroys, and sin damps the soul, and sin destroys, and sin will bring eternal judgment. And so the only thing to do, the right thing to do, will be to run away from that sin, to repent from the sin. And we, have, we find that the uniform testimony of Scripture and the uniform proclamation of Scripture, there must be repentance before salvation. Without repentance, there can be no salvation. If a man is just thinking, the man is just thinking, okay, I raise up my hand, I receive him as my savior. On what grounds? You must turn from sin, repent of sin, turn away from darkness and come into the light. And then you receive him as savior. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 14. Mark 1 Verse 14, now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, 
the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Look at this. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Every individual that hears the word, repent ye. And then after that, you believe the good news. Everyone that is coming to the knowledge of the sins he has committed, of the sins he has practiced, of the evil he has done, repent ye, it's personal. Repent ye at this present time. Repent ye all the sins that have been committed in the past. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's the way of salvation. That's what happens before salvation comes in. Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 6. Luke chapter 3, verse 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh must hear. All flesh must know. All flesh will eventually see, those who believe, the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Salvation is available. And for you to come into that salvation, you must actually flee, run, get away, turn from the wrath to come. Verse 8, bring forth therefore the fruits worthy of repentance for them to see the salvation of God which he has provided he says they must bring forth the evidence the product of repentance there must be repentance before anyone will see the salvation of the Lord and begin not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Repentance before salvation. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 47. Luke Chapter 24, verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. You see the order there? Repentance first, and then after that, remission of sin. Repentance first, after that, forgiveness of the sins that are repented of. You confess and forsake the sin. And then there will be freedom from sin. There will be salvation. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. It's not peculiar to Israel. It's not peculiar to Jerusalem. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Second Peter chapter 3. If we don't preach repentance and the people don't know the danger of continuing in sin and they just think that salvation has come is for everyone, raise up your hand, accept the salvation now, accept Jesus. They have their sin, they have Jesus on top. They have their evil, they have Jesus along with the evil. They have their iniquity, they have Jesus along with the iniquity. Salvation doesn't come that way. There must be the proclamation. There must be the preaching. There must be the declaration of repentance toward God before the salvation comes in. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But his long suffering towards what? 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All who want to experience the salvation of the Lord, they come to repentance. It's after that repentance, the conversion comes. After that repentance, the forgiveness comes. After that repentance, then they will be counted as children of God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, reading from verse 19. Acts, chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted. You see, repentance always comes first, before the conversion, before the salvation, before the transformation. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. The sins will not be blotted out if there is no repentance. One will not be cleansed if there is no repentance. And there will be no joy of salvation without repentance. There will be no assurance of salvation without repentance. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing. The times of refreshing will come with the cleansing, with the pardon, with the grace, with the adoption to the family of God as repentance has taken place. It says, only then the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Was a blessing in turning every one of you from his iniquities. He grants us forgiveness and then he grants us salvation. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 30 and verse 31. Acts Chapter 5, verse 30, verse 31. The God of our fathers restored Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted by his right hand to be a prince and a savior. How does he save? He gives repentance for to give repentance unto Israel. And after that repentance, he grants forgiveness of sins. It's false assurance to promise someone salvation without emphasizing repentance. That's why we have a lot of superficial people who say they are converts. And they cannot obey the word of God. They cannot stand on the truth of God. They do not have the love, the joy, the delight in the word of God. They don't have the victory that salvation brings because the salvation is not real. They raised up their hands. They said they gave their lives to the Lord, but there was no repentance preceding that. Look at that verse 31. Him, Christ. Him, the Savior. Him, our Lord and Master. Him, as God exalted by his right hand to be a prince and a Savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Please hold on to that. Understand that. And when you are presenting the word of salvation to others, make sure you remember, they must know about the danger of sin, the damnation of sin, the evil sin in sin, and the judgment that will come because of sin. And they turn, turn away from their sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
after that repentance and salvation comes. Repentance first. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And in terms of this ignorance, God winged at the past ignorance, the foolish things that those sinners have done in their ignorance, lack of knowledge, and they have gone into all kinds of evil. The Lord is willing to overlook, willing to forgive, and willing to pass by, pass over all those things that happen. But one condition, look at this, but now commandest all men everywhere to repent. Now he commands, he expects, he demands, and it's a commandment of God now for every sinner if salvation is going to come. But now commandest all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which you will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has whom he has ordained, whereof he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. Acts chapter 20. Verses 20 and 21. Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. And how I kept nothing that was profitable unto you. I kept back nothing. If we don't tell sinners about repentance, we're keeping back something profitable something necessary, something indispensable, something that will be a leeway, an open door to their salvation. We're denying them of having a genuine experience of salvation. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly on the pulpit, and from house to house, privately, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. That's the first thing is seen out to know, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot jump over repentance and just say, believe. Believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. He says, I've not kept anything back that was profitable unto you. And what's the profitable thing? Repentance toward God. And then after that repentance, there's faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 26. And I'm reading from verse 19. Acts Chapter 26, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Was the heavenly vision? Go and bring the people to the path of salvation. Tell them the good news. Preach the gospel. Call them to salvation. And was that a vision? What does it entail? Look at verse 20. But I showed forced unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. That's the heavenly vision that they should repent. That's how they get the benefit of the salvation of Christ that they should repent. They should turn, turn from evil, turn from sin, every form of sin, every shade of sin, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. 
Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow. Now he understands, the sinner understands, sin is deadly. Sin is damning. Sin is destructive. And looking at the destruction coming because of the sins he has committed, he had sorrow of heart, sorrow and shame, and the pain of what he had done against the Lord grips him. And he does not want to keep on repeating that same thing and get himself to offending God more and more. That's why it says he has sorrow. And it is godly sorrow. Is that godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world walketh days. If the person only has sorrow because of the consequence of sin, because of what he lost, because now the shame is a terrible sin, all that he has done has now come to the open, and people are looking at him, so you did that, so you could have done that. And he has the sorrow of the world, that one brings destruction. But if it's not because of the shame, it's because he sees the degradation, and he sees the iniquity, and he sees the offense against God. He says, godly sorrow works repentance not to be regretted of. He tells us in Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 24. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Those who have gone astray and they are coming back to the Lord, that the Lord will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Only then will verse 26 occur. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, reading from verses 15 and 16. Revelation chapter 3. Reading from verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. I'll disown you. I'll disherit you. I'll not have you anything to do with you. I will separate you from me and from my kingdom. Look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. You've seen it all over. If we're going to have the favor of God, restoration into his grace, Restoration into his mercy, restoration into his kingdom, restoration of the salvation that he wants to give us. He wants us because he loves us. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasing, repent therefore. And then he says, be zealous therefore and repent. Then he says, behold, 
if you repent. Behold, if you turn away from sin, behold, I stand at the door and know if any man hear my voice and he opens the door, I will come in to him. I will sup with him and he with me. And to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I pray that we will have ears to hear. You will have ears to hear. And our audience, the people we're talking to, either we're talking to them on an individual basis, or we're talking to them in a hall, in a church building, an audience, they will have ears to hear in Jesus' name. Let everybody shout, Amen. Amen. Point number two now. After repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the person who has said the word understands the word, he turns away from sin, he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation now comes in, and the Spirit of God bears witness in his heart that now he is saved. There is something that makes us to know that that salvation is real, and that is righteousness. And as you look through the scriptures, you'll find righteousness and salvation attached together. If somebody has salvation, he has righteousness. If somebody manifests righteousness, it's because salvation has come in. Those two words are inseparable in the life of a convert, in the life of a child of God. Salvation, righteousness. Righteousness, salvation. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're looking at the connection between righteousness and salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. The chief thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Remember, Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans. And remember, Paul, the apostle, had emphasized repentance, repentance, repentance all over. And as the person repents, and now he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. He confesses with his mouth Jesus as Lord. He says, I shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, look at this, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You find those two words there in that verse 10, the righteousness and the salvation. He believes in the heart that leads him to righteousness. He confesses with the mouth that brings the salvation, salvation and righteousness. Isaiah chapter 45, reading from verse 8, the connection between righteousness and salvation. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 8, drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. This is not self-righteousness, this one is coming from above, from the skies, from heaven. From the Lord himself, drop down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. 
Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. And that's why he now calls in verse 22, Look unto me, all ye the ends, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. He calls us to salvation, and thereby calls us to righteousness. He calls us to righteousness, and that righteousness comes through salvation. Salvation brings righteousness. Salvation makes us to live in righteousness. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has closed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Can you see those two words again? The experience of salvation brings practical righteousness. It gives us the strength and the grace and the power and the standing to be able to live in righteousness. Salvation comes and then immediately we find righteousness being possible in our lives. And this is for everyone. There's no exception. Anywhere you find salvation in that heart, in that life, you will find righteousness. Not self-righteousness, it's the righteousness which comes by faith. And this is for everyone, it's for whosoever, whosoever will. In Romans chapter 10 verse 13, Romans Chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's for everyone. And when he calls and that salvation is given, it comes with righteousness. And it is not that man is struggling now to be righteous, but the grace is there, the strength is there. The presence of Christ is there, and the power to live the righteous life is there because salvation has come in. Psalm 71, verse 15. Psalm 71, reading from verse 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation. My mouth shall show forth in testimony, in preaching, in declaration. My mouth shall show forth in declaration thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. Look at Psalm 24, reading from verse 3 all through to verse Five, Psalm 24. We're reading from verse 3. It says in Psalm 24, verse 3, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Look at verse 5 now. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Righteousness from the God of his salvation. If God has saved that sinner, he will receive righteousness from the hand of that saving God. If the sins are forgiven, if the sins are taken away, 
if there's a new life, salvation comes with righteousness. The past is forgiven. The present is equipped and strengthened to live a righteous life. If there is no righteousness, we should still help the sinner to re-examine his profession. If there's no change of life, there's no newness in his character, there's no newness in his behavior, and there is no evidence that Christ is living the victorious life in him and through him, we should help the person to examine the life, confess the sin, forsake the sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and real salvation will come. I said real salvation will come. Romans chapter 6. Reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Now that yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You claim salvation. You profess salvation. You testify to the salvation of the Lord. Then no longer yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What's the answer? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are. To whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, were in the past. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, that's what salvation brings, free from sin. That's what salvation does, free from sin. That's what salvation imparts to every life. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Chapter 8 of Romans, reading from verse 1. Chapter 8 of Romans, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Those are saved people. They are in Christ Jesus. They are not living in the world and living for the world and living by the world and living like the world anymore. It says... They're now in Christ, in Christ Jesus. And because of that condemnation is gone. And they walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. A new life has come. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Salvation. Coming in brings a new law, a new oppression, a new mode of living, a new character, a new behavior, a new strength, a new focus in life. And that law of the spirit of life has made the convert free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. 
for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He doesn't approve of sin when he comes in a savior. He doesn't license sin when he comes in a savior. He doesn't promote sin when he comes in a savior. He doesn't encourage sin in any shape or shade or form. He condemns sin and he clears away the sin. And then in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Salvation has come. Righteousness has come. Salvation has come. Newness of life has come. Salvation has come. And the grace to live in newness of life has now come that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. I pray the Lord will affirm and confirm that in us and in our converts in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man, any man, anyone, any convert, any Christian, any professor, testifier of being born again, anywhere, under any preacher, in any church, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, how many things have become new? All things have become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to him, to himself, by Jesus Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation to which that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the righteousness unto them. They have repented of them. They have turned away from them. They have confessed them. They are forsaking them. And those sins are cleansed away from their lives. The sins are separated from them. And they are separated from their sins. And because of that now, he will not impute their trespasses unto them. But he has now committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you. In Christ's stead, if Christ were here, this is I will plead with you. Now he's not here physically. On his behalf, in Christ's stead, instead of Christ, don't expect him to come physically to you. We now stand for him on his behalf. And on his behalf, in Christ's church, we beseech you, be ye reconciled unto God. And when you are reconciled and you are saved, what happens? Verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us, sin offering for us. Sacrifice for sin for us. Substitute for the sinner. He has made him to be the sin offering. To be the sin bearer. To be our substitute. And to be the sacrifice for us. 
he knew no sin that he might that ye might be made that we might be made the righteousness of God in him salvation comes and now we are the righteousness of God in him I pray this righteousness will be real in every life so that people will not just be saying I am saved I am saved and there's no evidence and there's no righteousness and there's no change and there's no transformation salvation and righteousness will be joined together in every life in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 21 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 21 if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that she put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lost if you claim to be saved put them off old life former life corrupted life licentious life the evil life the sinful life corruption of the past with all the deception put everything off verse 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that she put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness righteousness and true holiness Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 verse 10 Philippians 3 verse 9 and be found in him now that I'm saved be found in him not having my own righteousness self-righteousness outward righteousness traditional righteousness Jewish righteousness not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then we have the righteousness that he imparts unto us by faith. Salvation comes with righteousness. First John chapter 3 from verse 4. First John chapter 3 from verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away, not to increase, to take away, not to license, to take away, not to establish sin, but to take away our sin. In him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Because if salvation had been there, righteousness would have been there. Little children, let us not deceive, let no man deceive you. And don't deceive yourself either. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, saved, 
adopted into the family of God and he professes I'm in Christ whosoever anyone anytime in every generation whosoever in the church on the crusade field whosoever is truly born of God does not commit sin does not continue in sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. If he does not do righteousness, does not practice righteousness, it's not of God. It doesn't prove that he has salvation because salvation and righteousness go together. The new birth and righteousness go together. Conversion and righteousness go together. New life, righteousness, they go together. The grace of God in man and righteousness in that new man, they go together. He who is born of God becomes righteous. There's enough grace to make him live the righteous life. And people will see and people will know he is righteous, that you are righteous that I am righteous, that each one of us is righteous, that our converts to are righteous in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now, promoting the reign of God. The reigning, the dominion, the control, the direction, the power to do the will of God on earth as it is done in heaven, that God reigns in the life of the believer, promoting the reign of God through salvation. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah Chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains at the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, of good that publisheth salvation, that says unto Zion, Thy God reigns. He brings salvation. He pro promises salvation. He publishes salvation. He declares salvation. And he says, by that salvation, in that salvation, through that salvation that enters into the heart of man, thy God reigns. He comes in and he reigns in the heart and the life of the one that has now come into Christ and Christ has come into him. The world no longer reigns. Sin no longer reigns. Evil no longer reigns. And tradition no longer reigns. And evil and the past life no longer reigns or having dominion over his life. But now salvation comes in and as he plunges himself to that true grace of God, our God reigns. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah 26 verse 13. O Lord our God, all that lords beside thee have had dominion over us. 
as we were away in the wilderness of sin, other lords have reigned over us. As we turned our backs to you, and we didn't acknowledge you, we didn't allow you in our hearts, in our lives, other lords have reigned over us. As we didn't concentrate on your word, and we didn't soak in your word, believe your word, live by your word, other lords have reigned over us. But by thee only, at this time now, we're going to reject, we're going to push off, we're going to throw off the dominion and the control and the reign of all those other laws. But now, by thee only, will we have, will we make mention of thy name. The Lord will reign in every one of our hearts. Judges chapter 8. And I read from verse 22, Judges chapter 8, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy sons, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. They didn't know who delivered them. It wasn't Gideon. It was God. He only used Gideon. Gideon was afraid. Gideon, Gideon was fearful. Gideon was timid. Gideon was uncertain that you could do anything. Who am I? I'm the least in my father's house. And God said, I'll be with you. I will strengthen you. And then he gave him, he showed him the interpretation of the dream of